Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. It's 2.15 in the afternoon here in the South Pacific, the middle of the South Pacific Ocean. My name is Jennifer Kingsley. I'm a journalist and the field correspondent for Lindblad Expeditions. And on the National Geographic Resolution, on this vessel, on this voyage, I have the great pleasure of traveling with Tom Ritchie, uh, a colleague, a mentor, one of the legends of Lindblad Expeditions, who's been with Lindblad companies for over 45 years. And because we are getting closer to Pitcairn Island, it's, we're about 160 nautical miles away, but this is a wonderful opportunity to talk to Tom about his experience, and we'll start with welcoming you and asking, what is unique about Pitcairn Island? Wow. I love Pitcairn. I've been there maybe 10 times over the years. It's almost smack dab in the center of Polynesia, the big Polynesian Triangle, which covers more than 10 million square miles, or 26 million square kilometers, if you prefer. It's a little volcanic islet, very small, but it's famous for our history because it was uh, the site of where the mutineers of the bounty ended up and lived out their lives after the famous mutiny. So tell us a little bit more about that because this is a famous story, but a very particular story, one that people are probably either very familiar with or not familiar with at all. So if you can tell us a bit, like what year did this happen and who was it that moved to Pitcairn and that maybe still their descendants live there today? It's a great story and it's worthy of all the books and movies that have been made about it. The, the story actually begins uh, in 1789 with a ship that was sent out to Polynesia, to Tahiti in particular, to gather up breadfruit trees, the seedlings. And so they had them in pots, and the idea was they would then transfer them to the Caribbean as a new cheap food for the African slaves working in the sugarcane plantations. So right off the beginning, it's an unpleasant story, I, I would say. And after spending nearly seven months in Tahiti, the sailors were not ready to leave. And conditions were crowded on the ship, and a lot of them had fallen in love with women in Tahiti and with Tahiti itself, because they were treated like kings. And so when the time came to leave, Many of them were not happy, and a short time after they started heading back with the load of breadfruit trees, the mutiny occurred for various reasons. And Captain Bly, who had been one of Captain Cook's captains, he was captain of the Resolution, and here we are on the namesake, National Geographic Resolution. But uh, Bly was put off in one of their uh, lifeboats with 18 more men who were loyal to him. He remained loyal to him after the mutiny. And he was set adrift in Tonga. And it took him something like 47 days to sail more than 3,000 nautical miles to reach Timor. And eventually he made his way back to London and told the story of what had happened. So this is the captain who was kicked off the bounty and he went in the opposite direction from the direction we're going in. And so the story of what happened next and where Pitcairn gets involved is what happened to the mutineers that stayed on board that vessel, which they essentially stole. Yes. Yeah, they had to find some place where they would be hidden because they could never go home. They were now criminals and were wanted men. And so they went back to Tahiti and they actually got some Tahitian women and men who joined them on the ship Actually, some of the men stowed away and they weren't discovered until later. And so um, there were 12 women and six men, Tahitian men, I mean, and then the nine mutineers. And they went searching for a place to hide out. Um, Christian, Fletcher Christian knew about an island that had only recently been discovered and charted. And they went looking for it and eventually found it. It was mischarted. So that was even perfect. It was outside of the shipping lanes and it would not likely be found anytime soon. And so they chose this as a, as a new home. They destroyed the ship, the bounty, 
in the bay so that no one would ever be you know, liable to, to leave and, and give word where they were located. Fortunately, the island had been inhabited by Polynesians maybe 500 years earlier, and so it had already been pre-made for survival with breadfruit trees and banana trees and mangoes and taro and everything that you know, Polynesians uh, need for survival, and it was all there, so it was perfect for them, perfect hiding place. And so is it the community today? Tell us about the relationship between the community today and those that initially came on the bounty. Yeah. Many of the residents there today are direct descendants. Uh, the initial settlement, well, it was called Adams Town. It is called Adams Town. Uh, it wasn't all fun and games, though, because life was hard, and after a while, the few Tahitian men were resentful that all the Tahitian women had become wives and consorts of the mutineers, the Englishmen. And so there, after four years, the Tahitian men killed most of, murdered most of the Englishmen. The Tahitian women were very upset, and they poisoned and they killed all the Tahitian men. I mean, it's a horrible history, but an amazing history. But many children were born very quickly, and they are the ones, they are the modern-day descendants now of the original mutineers that settled there. Now, there have been whalers and, and shipwreck victims and just people who wanted to live there who have brought in, you know, genetic uh, <laughs> new diversity. yeah diversity into the population. The population is less than 50 people now. And so a population of less than 50 people, about 160 nautical miles from where we are right now. And as you can see, right now we have extraordinary conditions. This is not always the case. Uh, this island is very difficult to reach for its isolation, for the sea state. But can you help contextualize this tiny island within this huge area you were talking about? You know, Polynesia, how close are we right now to the edges of it? And what does it mean for the rest of the world? Yeah, Polynesia is just a part, but a major part of the Pacific Ocean. And along with Melanesia and Micronesia and Indonesia, these are island groups that are defined by their cultures. So Polynesia is, this, is considered a triangle with the points being Hawaii to the north, Easter Island or Rapa Nui to the southwest, and New Zealand to... Uh, Rapa Nui in the south... Uh, in the east. Southeast. southeast. And then New Zealand in the southwest. Sorry, sorry about that. But uh, a massive area. But the reason we call all of this Polynesia is because it's a single culture and, and language group. So you know, everybody can communicate and there's always been trade and long distance travel that the Polynesians maintained with their magnificent uh, boats, you know, sailing canoes with outriggers and double hauled canoes. And they had trade going on a thousand years ago. They had already inhabited all of the islands, all the inhabitable islands in Polynesia. I mean, it's a, an incredible feat and accomplishment. And one of the major, I think, accomplishments of humanity. And my understanding is those designations that we hear, Melanesia, Micronesia, Polynesia, I mean, those were laid over by an outsider. Yet, the cohesion between the islands, that shared culture and languages that you're talking about, that's something that very much comes from the original migration of people coming to this area. So I would imagine there are not a lot of people who have 10 visits to Pitcairn under their belt, but do you have a special memory or a special place on the island that you could share with us? Oh, the first time I went there, I made a, a very dear friend with a guy named Christy Warren, who was a direct descendant. And many of the people on Pitcairn Island are artisans and artists. And Christy Warren made a shark out of Miro wood, you know, the um, Polynesian rosewood, and gave it to me. And I have that hanging in my house. And he's, 
etched it on the back with his name. And he's long gone. I've, every time I go there, I go and visit his grave. But uh, he was my real friend on Pitcairn Island. And, and uh, he took me to his house. And I really learned how the Pitcairn Islanders live through him. And I'll tell you, I learned a little bit of their language. It's, English is the official language because Pitcairn is an, a British overseas territory. But they speak a Pitcairnese type language, which is a hodgepodge of English words and Polynesian words because the original population. Just, and when you hear Pitcairn Islanders speaking to each other, they use the, the, that language, their own language. It's unique in the world. You can almost understand it and you get bits and pieces of that, but it's delightful to listen to. Maybe you can record some of that because it's really fun. And, you know, for we're so fortunate to be here on the National Geographic Resolution. If we did not have this kind of vessel to take us to Pitcairn, how would a person get there or get away from there today? Uh, you wouldn't. You've got to go by ship. In the past, occasionally a supply vessel will come in, but it's irregular, it's not dependable. So people will, will in the modern day, uh, with uh, communications, you know, satellite communication and computers and cell phones and things, they can order something from England or South America or whatever, but for it to get here is another story. And so it just depends on a vessel being able to reach Pitcairn Island, whether it's scheduled or you know happenstance that they were able to organize it um, there's no airport there's no ferry service you have to come out by by ship so it sounds like some of the original aims of Fletcher Christian when he was looking for a place that would be hard to find hard to get to um, and really be very isolated that that was not only true then but in certain ways it's true today yes they established themselves there in 1791 and it wasn't until 1807 that a ship found them or even saw Pitcairn Island because like I said it was mis, uh, mischarted and so a ship an American vessel called the Topaz saw the island and when they approached they saw that there was a settlement there and they learned that there was one mutineer original mutineer still alive uh, John Adams. He actually goes by, went by two different names, but he had gotten religion, and he salvaged the Bible off the bounty, and set up a school for the many children that had been born, and uh, converted everybody to strong Christianity. And he was an upstanding, you know, pillar of society when the population was discovered. And so there were no more repercussions, you know. They didn't come out and arrest him or, or punish him or anything like that. They just decided to let, let them be. Okay. And, uh, yes. Well, uh, an island with a small population in a very unusual place, but an outstanding story and certainly a very interesting part of the South Pacific. And thanks to everyone out there for joining us today here on the National Geographic Resolution. Wait till you see it. Wait till you see it. <laughs>